Surprisingly, it's not exactly difficult to lose track of a tunnel, and believe me, New York City has forgotten about several of their own, be it from the city's expansion to the events of World War II, or just plain old falling out of use. The fact is, there are cavernous mazes of man-made spaces under the city that have literally been lost and forgotten. Today, I will present you a few stories of the forgotten tunnels of New York City. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Most of us know the surface level history of New York, such as the fact that it was founded as a Dutch trading post under the name New Amsterdam in 1626, or became a city in 1653. These are the types of facts that are rather easy to follow, as they recall events that affected people in obvious ways. However, within the near four centuries of the city's history, there are countless underground elements that enabled life to unfold, be it out of sight. And with out of sight being out of mind, documentation becomes obscure and easy to forget. Elements of underground urban infrastructure here fall into this category, especially when it comes to the train tunnels of the 19th century. In 1844, before Brooklyn was a part of New York City and was simply the city of Brooklyn, there was a strong desire for the population to gain fast and reliable methods of traveling to their pier to better catch a ferry to Manhattan. However, the trains serving the city at that time, the Long Island Railroad, did not have brakes powerful enough to safely operate at road level. As a result, the Atlantic Avenue Tunnel, also known as the Cobble Hill Tunnel, was constructed in merely seven months first by cutting open the earth and digging out what was essentially a large valley and then covering it with a tunnel roof. This amazing tunnel was a half mile long and had space for two railway tracks, eliminating risk to pedestrian traffic and helping travelers avoid delays, making the tunnel a very swift method of travel and a novel concept by the time it was finished in 1845. In many circles, this tunnel was considered to be the world's first subway, performing very well and serving until 1861, when the city of Brooklyn banned steam locomotives within city limits entirely. Long story short, Brooklyn just sealed it off and it was mostly forgotten about. However, not long after, rumors and conspiracies would kick the tunnel back into public eye. In 1916, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, then known as the Bureau of Investigation, had a hunch that the tunnel was being used as a base for German terrorism. While nothing came of this theory, the suspicions returned again in the 1940s when the FBI supposedly believed that the tunnel was being used to house spies for the Third Reich, though there also does not appear to be any supporting evidence of this claim. So again, by 1950, everyone had basically forgotten about the tunnel. However, a minor mythical status lingered. After all, the world's first subway tunnel later was suspected by the US government to be the layer of spies. Legends were simply inevitable. People became so mystified by the topic that a pair of historians actually attempted to locate the forgotten tunnel, but to no avail. It would seem almost as if the Cobble Hill Tunnel did not physically exist. So let's fast forward to 1980, when it was discovered. In 1980, one Robert Diamond set out on a journey to the Cobble Hill Tunnel. His search consisted of crawling around into sealed portions of underground Brooklyn, when one day he happened upon a concrete wall with protruding bricks and stones. So with the help of a crowbar and some elbow grease, he was able to break open and unseal the Atlantic Avenue Tunnel. He was so excited by his discovery that he began conducting tours to other curious minds, though this was short-lived. The New York City Fire Department shut down his tour service after they heard he was prying open a manhole cover in broad daylight in the middle of the street. You see, this was necessary so that he could allow guests to access the tunnels via a ramshackle ladder, citing some very obvious safety concerns. All the same, Bob Diamond is still very well remembered for being the man that rediscovered the world's first subway tunnel. 
Moving on, we have the story of New York's lost mail tunnel. Let's start the journey at the James A. Farley Building, which is New York City's primary post office and once operated 24-7 until the recession forced it to begin closing at 10 p.m. back in 2009. Built in 1914 in the Beaux-Arts style, just like Grand Central Terminal and Michigan Central Station, which we've talked about in previous videos, it has been a very busy building throughout its history. And over the years, mystery has widely surrounded this building. You see, locals have observed much of it to be empty, an observation that would raise important questions. For example, if this postal office is so busy and so important, yet mostly empty, where does all the mail actually get processed? The answer comes from a set of buildings just down the block on 9th Avenue, where you will find the Morgan Processing and Distribution Center, the USPS's largest sorting facility. It is a massive complex of buildings, taking up two entire city blocks, processing all the mail going in and out of the postal office. Previously, the Morgan Center and the Farley Post Office were connected by a freight railway, which crossed a viaduct, but when it fell out of use, another route of travel was needed. And considering how close these two facilities are together, the natural response would probably be simple, like take the mail down the road. But with the hustle and bustle of city life and roads clogged with traffic, that's much easier said than done. So a tunnel was dug between the two facilities, generally following 9th Avenue, and that is where the mail flowed. This mail tunnel served its purpose well until 2002, at which point the hauling of mail ceased as the New York state government began talks to purchase the Farley building and transform it into a train hall. Naturally, after the tunnel's closure, they fell into abandonment and despair. The stairs and elevators leading below ground were sealed shut and rats began to infest the vacant space. Finally, the Farley building also contains an entrance to tracks from Penn Station, which is yet again another building that we've talked about on previous episodes, though it was never used for passenger service. This forgotten tunnel was swept and secured by the Secret Service with the intention of it being used during the Pope's 2015 visit. But that's about all we know. This tunnel has met a very similar fate to the Farley Morgan Mail Tunnel, as all of its entrances have been sealed. The city even went as far as welding shut manholes to make sure that absolutely nobody could get inside. Now let's head back over to Brooklyn where we will discover the tunnels that once supported a swimming pool that accommodated thousands and thousands of people at a time. From 1903 to 1905, the city of New York acquired four plots of land in Brooklyn surrounded by all sorts of industrial works, chemical plants, ironworks, and more. These plots of land would be developed into a park, first known as Greenpoint Park. Being renamed to McCarran Park in 1909 after Patrick Henry McCarran, a popular politician who passed away in that same year. Initially being a collection of playgrounds and athletic facilities, the park gradually expanded, adding more facilities and gardens as the 20th century rolled forward. By 1936, as part of President Roosevelt's New Deal, the WPA, or Works Progress Administration, built 11 state-of-the-art pools in New York City, one of which was the McCarran Park Pool. The pool was quite nice, even by today's standard. This pool offered a gigantic capacity of 6,800 swimmers, with filtration and heating systems, all controlled by an enormous boiler room. This boiler room was connected to an even more enormous tunnel system all the way around the perimeter to keep systems in check. This pool was so modern that it even had underwater lighting, which was unheard of for the time. Well, the pool was a hit and a major social hub for the community, by 1984, it had fallen into a poor state and hence was closed, but the tunnel system remained. Circling directly beneath the pool deck and with an entrance to both the boiler and filtration room, the tunnel is almost as impressive as the pool itself, lying abandoned for 20 years until the pool came to be used as a concert and entertainment venue. Amazingly, by 2012, the pool had been refurbished and was reopened, this time with a capacity of 1,500 swimmers. It isn't as large as it once was. The diving pool has been filled in and converted into a volleyball court, and some of the 100-year-old tunnel system is still utilized, but much of it sits untouched and abandoned right under the park. 
Now let's discuss a tunnel for the academic elitist, with the story leading up to its existence and ultimate abandonment being simply unbelievable. Bull Hall is an oddity among the buildings of Columbia University, and many feel it does not fit in with the rest of the buildings at the college. Indeed, it has a very unusual past. In 1769, a student of the Columbia University by the name of Dr. Samuel Bard gave a speech that inspired the creation of a hospital. Thanks to fundraising efforts by Henry Moore, the province of New York's royal governor, the hospital was fully established in 1771. This hospital had a wing for mental illness, which was thought to be sufficient in capacity, but by the turn of the century, the amount of cases had risen to the point that expansion was required. Thus, the lunatic asylum was constructed in 1808, with the absence of hospital in the name being no mistake. It was designed as an 80-bed refuge from the rest of the complex, while asylum would have been considered to be even worse than the name hospital by today's standards. The New York Lunatic Asylum was actually one of the first mental institutions to rein in the restraining equipment commonly associated with mental health treatment of the time, such as straitjackets. In 1820, a lack of space forced yet another expansion, this time to a 26-acre farm next to Bloomingdale Road, which is now known as Broadway. So in a year, the Bloomingdale Asylum opened with a separate building for women opened six years later. These asylums continued the practices of their predecessors, focusing on what they called quote-unquote moral treatment rather than medical treatment. In some cases, granting greater freedom to their patients at a time when the standard of mental health treatment was often locking the patient up, and throwing away the key. Though that's not to say they were a moral bastion by any means from today's standard. For example, their primary form of restraint was a long sleeve shirt with leather hand shackles. Formally, they prohibited the use of straight jackets, but they did make frequent use of the quote unquote tranquilizer chair, in which an overactive patient would be seated in a heavy wooden chair, strapped down at the chest, abdomen, knees, ankles, and wrists. Then, a wooden box would be placed over their head. This was all done to allow for easier bloodletting, which was a common treatment at the time. And although it's probably rather obvious, it's been proven to be medically pointless today. By 1839, financial difficulties forced the asylum to focus on profit, and the treatment quality suffered greatly. In 1872, Julius Chambers wrote a number of pieces for the New York Times, revealing that the asylum had lost their commitment to moral treatment, he documented closed cells, uncomfortable beds and chairs, foul food, filthy baths, all run by rude and vulgar attendants. While the controversies did put a dent in the activities of the institution, the financial issues were inevitably what put the asylum under. The nearby neighborhood began putting pressure on the undesirable asylum in their backyard, and cost of living began to rise so the asylum had to shut its doors and sell off its land. This is when Columbia took possession of the land between 116th and 120th Street, looking to expand the campus to new areas. The university had most of the buildings torn down, so next to none of Bloomingdale Asylum was left. And as far as most people are concerned, the only remnant left is Buell Hall. But what they fail to realize is that there were also plenty of tunnels from the asylum left behind. Almost no one realizes it, but beneath the asylum was a system of tunnels connecting all of the buildings in the complex together. After the university purchased the grounds, these tunnels remained. The tunnels were used during World War II for wartime research and were said to have assisted in the United States Manhattan Project, aiding in the creation of the most powerful weapon humanity has ever seen. There was also a short period before 1957 that the tunnels were used as a pedestrian walkway, but after the college walk was constructed, they fell out of use again in that regard as well. One more major point in history that these tunnels were used was around the time of the Vietnam War. You see, the military draft began to greatly increase in scale, putting in 2.2 million people between 1965 and 1970. And in that time, students became enraged, as some claimed that the university had sent out the class rankings to draft boards with the intention of removing underperforming students from the campus and sending them overseas. While this practice concluded in 1967, the next year would see the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and cities across America went mad. 
This anger, combined with other strong social tensions on campus, detonated into a series of protests in late March of 1968. These protests climax with the occupation of many of the university's buildings, which happened multiple times throughout the year of 1968. Throughout these protests, students would use the tunnels to communicate with other buildings, making sure that no sudden development was unknown, and that no group was left out of the loop. Ironically, the tunnels would also play a key role in the administration reclaiming their buildings. The tunnels beneath Columbia University remain there to this day, and while more and more passages are being blocked as time goes on, people continue to explore. While the tunnel's origins remain a mystery, some explorers have found markings on I-beams in the tunnel dating back as far as July of 1885. Sometimes, history remains half-written, I suppose. Last up is probably the most interesting forgotten tunnel, as it has seen the likes of world leaders. Track number 61. This platform was once part of Grand Central Terminal and was not constructed for pedestrian use within the New York City subway. Rather, it was a powerhouse and a place to put unused trains in the 1910s. Back then, it was known as New York Central Railroad, now known as Metro North. Its powerhouse was connected to Grand Central Terminal and other buildings in the area, but which were knocked down when the Waldorf Hotel purchased the air rights above the tracks, and by technicality, gained ownership of those tracks. The hotel adapted track number 61 to be used as a private railway siding by which guests with their own rail cars could immediately be connected to the hotel. The first major name to use this service was General John J. Pershing in 1938, who entered the hotel via the service. And while some believe that there is still a rail car remaining on track number 61 that belonged to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who appears to like popping up in today's stories, the only real connection that could be found between FDR and track number 61 was a secret service schedule during the campaign season of 1944, where on October the 21st, he entered and exited the building using this railway siding. Track 61 would end up concealing the comings and goings of several presidents throughout history, and was prepared for use as recently as 2003, when it was laid out as an escape route for President George W. Bush during a UN General Assembly meeting in the hotel. Tunnels are fascinating, as they are not widely appreciated when in use, and mostly forgotten the moment they go out of use. And yet, as we have learned today, the elements that have graced these abandoned places range from trains, to world leaders, asylums, the world's brightest students, and plumbing equipment. And as absurd of a range as that list might be, every item has one commonality, the need for concealment. Perhaps this is why, on a deeper level, we are enchanted by tunnels and the mysterious places of America that have been forgotten. And with that, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.